Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of Violent Vision. Here we are with episode 114. Uh, tonight's very special guest is Christian Limbach of Whores. Christian is the uh, singer and guitarist for the band Whores, which uh, is a great, heavy, hard rock, brutal band, noise rock, if you will. Um, I'm loving listening to their music right now. Um, the new album is called War. It'll be out in its... In, its entirety in April 16th. Right now you can get three tracks off of that album if you go to their Bandcamp page. Uh, links will be provided in the show notes, so if you want to find an easy link, it's there There it's going to be. Uh, Hordes is an amazing band, and they're really blowing up, actually. Uh, the new album, War, uh, due out April 16th, is actually currently in its third pressing, and it's, it's still in pre-sale status. So there are a number of different variations of the vinyl that have already been uh, sold, sold out now. And there's a few more that are going to be available specifically through the band and through the, the record label TGIC, <clears throat> but uh, still currently in pre-sale status. So get those now, get it now while you can, because it's very, very likely that they will be gone very, very soon. <laughs> album of discussion tonight is Helmet's uh, 1992 major label debut, Meantime. Uh, great album uh, overall. Uh, it's not a, I'm not a huge fan of Helmet. I mean, I really do like their stuff. And when I was a kid, when this album came out, I was definitely impressed by it and definitely liked it a lot. Um, so I was happy to kind of dig into it and get uh, as much information out of it as I could, which was not much. Uh, it's kind of hard to find a lot of stuff about these songs on this album, but um, but we had a great conversation, and uh, you know obviously this had a, a major effect on Christian and the way that he makes music, and we discussed that. Um, so for those of you who like Helmet, uh, Meantime, uh, that don't know Horrors, I think you'll really like Horrors. You should get into them. You should give them a shot. And the opposite, if you uh, happen to be a fan of Horrors and you for some odd reason don't know Helmet, don't know Meantime. Uh, you, you should give it a shot. You'll probably like it. That's it for now, folks. I mean, uh, if you uh, like the show or any other shows that we've done in the past, by all means, go check out our previous catalog and uh, do all the things you do with the internet is what we ask here. Like, share, subscribe, comment, rate, review, all of those things. They all help us uh, immensely. If you care to help us out in a more financial way, uh, which we need desperately, you can visit our website, psychicstatic.net. Any purchase you make there goes towards funding this thing. And we have many things, many records there. We have merch, t-shirts and stuff, uh, the bands that we release, The Hammer Party and Narnia. Uh, Narnia's full-length release is coming out very, very soon. Still kind of figuring that out. But it's uh, it's definitely in the works and it's definitely on its way. So um, we would appreciate that very much if you'd like to do that. Uh, thank you, folks, and enjoy. Hey, Christian. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. I just spoke with um, Curran Reynolds. Oh, like ten minutes ago. Yeah. Uh oh. I noticed I... he had done your uh, your podcast as well. Right. I mean, and, and yeah. speaking of that, I mean, we, we just jumped into the whole Curran thing, but I mean, uh, I don't even know who it was that reached out to me from the Ghost Is Clear. Was it Bobby or is it Brian? Both guys own and operate the label, so I'm not sure which one it was. Okay, they hit me up through Instagram, so I, I don't. Yeah, there's a Bobby sure. and a Brian. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure which one was messaging me. He never, never said. I was just like, I, I don't know. I just, I didn't think to ask. I was just like, whatever. I mean, I appreciate you, you reaching out to me and, and, you yeah, know, making this happen. Nice fellas, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're the only label really that we had interest, of course, from, well, I shouldn't say, of course, that sounds shitty, but, um, but we have spoken to a couple of different people and like, he was the only person who really kind of understood what we were doing. It wasn't just trying to take a giant, piece of everything from us and do very little in exchange for it right and i'm not going to throw shade on anyone else but like it's a real hustle man bands are really getting hustled you know they're selling away the rights the masters of their music for nothing for a couple grand you know yeah and, still still that's happening oh yeah i mean two of the deals that we were offered one of them wanted to own our masters indefinitely Whoa. And they weren't offering us that much money. And like, it's a conversation at, at a certain dollar mark, but 
that dollar mark is way higher than anyone would pay for it. So like, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's yeah, forever. I mean, that means forever. like, and then another one wanted to own it till, uh, 15 years from now. And we're like, that's ridiculous. You might as well, well own it forever. And it was pennies, man. And we're just like, right. I think they sort of, I don't want to say, I don't think they're predatory, but I think there's, they're cognizant of the ignorance of most musicians and what all these different things mean. And mm. They take advantage of it, man. And it's just, yeah. I'm just tired of the whole thing, the whole machine. Right. I mean, I grew up on Discord and Touch and Go and, and labels who did, you know, 50 50 deals. Um, and still, those deals, when they say after expenses, that's after the label's expenses. You're still responsible for, you know, paying for recording and editing and, and, or um, mixing and mastering and all that stuff. Your expenses don't get covered. <clears throat> it's just right. the, the expenses of, you know, producing the physical product and, and promoting it. Once those are recouped, it's 50 50, um, which is right. it's still heavily weighed in the favor of the label. And that's the best deal ever. Yeah. And everything else besides that, people want giant chunks of digital. And it's like it costs when you use TuneCore or CD Baby or one of these services, it costs about $70 a year to put a record on the Internet everywhere. Right. Do you know what I mean? It costs yeah. nothing. Right. And for them to take huge pieces of it, it's like, for what? You didn't do any of the work. Why? you know they're and just running scared it, right. because they can't make real money on physical products anymore you know trying to get t-shirt right. money from bands it's terrible man right right i and mean the I, I talked to... didn't do any of that shit you know yeah we did a, an arrangement where during the pre-sale they get all of the money from the band camp downloads um and then after the pre-sale uh, all the digital will go to us and then we have a a decent split percentage wise on physical products it's essentially a licensing deal but after we sold the first two pressings, I mean, we sold that first pressing in like three hours Jesus. and the second one sold out too. And then, so we had a talk with them. I was speaking to Ryan, our friend who's engineered our last couple of records and hopefully we'll always engineer our records. And because he was partnering with us to potentially self-release and he was, he was really upset. He's like, you just gave this record away. And I'm like, he doesn't know them. I'm like, they're actually, we didn't, they're very nice people. This is the, the arrangement that allowed us to keep the record. I know it looks like, they made 20 grand in an afternoon and they did, but they're not owning our record. They're not owning the digital. And, you know, and after we spoke about it, we, our percentage of copies received was increased significantly um, yeah. and good on them, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's just fair. I mean, I think that that's they're music the, lovers. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, and me too. Like I, I put out records too now. And so I, I spoke with Chris X uh, fairly recently sure. for Reptilian, he's great. you know? Yeah. He's yeah. Great. And I had a great talk with him and, and he kind of, you know, kind of shed some light on on the current situation of the music industry and, yeah. you know, on a small scale, which is like what he does. And and, and just like that, he says, like, you know, I do handshake deals and it's like all, yes. all licensing. I basically just hold on to it, like for as long as they want me to, like as long as right. they're happy with me pressing it and me selling the physical copies, then we're good. Yeah, he's I mean, so we didn't speak to him about actual like deal points or anything. Mm -hmm. Um so he's not one of the people that I was mentioning that we spoke to. Uh, he's a great guy. Yeah. And he's got a great taste for music. I mean, I remember going to Baltimore in the early days of the band to um, to play shows and Reptilian, the physical store there had just closed and he moved to Austin shortly after that. But I've I've known about him long before I knew him and he's an OG for sure. He's a good guy. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure how much of that you're going to want to include in this conversation publicly. Never. It's casual. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. That's cool, man. Well, uh, you know, hey, it's, I just want to say that it's a pleasure to to be speaking with you. I'm uh, glad that you're here with me. Where are Likewise. you right now? What's happening? I'm in uh, New York City. Oh, okay. I'm you're here clearly until... in the van. What's what's yeah. going on? Yeah, it's well the um the apartment where I I noticed that a lot of people when they record podcasts in an apartment, their walls aren't treated, and it's real. I mean, that's just coming from because I'm a musician. I hear the sound bouncing around. Sure. And it's really it's really not pleasing. And I think a big part of the podcast game is having decent audio. Sure. So, I mean, I'm not using a real microphone and an interface. I'm just using the phone. So that's already a strike. But I figured this is a little better as far as sound bouncing around. And OK, whatever. well, you're comfortable. I mean, like we're going to be here for a little while. So, I mean, yeah, so yeah, I, um, I'm up here in, t in New York until mid April um, working. And then after uh, I think the record comes out. <laughs> uh mid-april also and then uh and then it's tour pretty much at the end of the year a couple different things are announcing one uh, well we'll talk about this in the podcast we have a bunch of shit coming up but i'm just right. here working uh until the band really cranks up again 
Okay, cool, man. Yeah. Well, so speaking of the new record, uh, I've only been able to hear four tracks minus the the one single that's been released, uh, Imposter right. Syndrome, right? Right. Yeah, we did like a um, that link that you got is imposter and then the three that we're releasing prior to the record coming out only one of those has been released publicly okay and then the second one will really be released um on friday of, of february and then the third one will be in march okay um, so yeah yeah um so i mean what i've been able to hear so far is pretty fucking amazing i really like <laughs> it oh well, thank you yeah no no problem i mean like I, I i know i've heard of your band horrors like but i don't know where along the lines it came across my table you know sure. and then um so when tgic reached out to me i was just like yeah oh yeah 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 i remember <laughs> I, I i needed to listen to this anyway so I, oh, cool. I listened i listened to everything and i'm just like this fucking band rocks oh thanks yeah been the working. whole catalog thank you i've been working pretty hard you know yeah, yeah, man. I mean, it's like it, it's anthemic too. You know, it's just like I can just sure. like imagine like a hot, sweaty night of like fist pumping in unison to this music. <laughs> yeah, we get a pretty physical response sometimes. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's definitely by design that it's like we're not the name already kind of puts us outside of what would ever be considered mainstream. Oh, but yeah. we're not afraid of verse, chorus, verse. Yeah, we're definitely not afraid of big, big choruses and. The new record has a lot of harmonies on it uh, that Douglas, our drummer, um, did. And uh, yeah, we're not afraid of that stuff at all. OK, I actually wanted to touch on that because uh, I haven't been able to find like a very good uh, current list of the existing lineup. Is it uh, it's you, sure. Casey Max, Maxwell on bass? Yes. And Douglas Jennings Barrett on drums? That's correct. Awesome. He's a great drummer. I love him. Oh, he's a sweetheart. He um, you know, we had him. He's from Montana. But okay. uh, from Missoula. But um, when we were looking for someone to play drums, he had he had flown down here to to play with us, and we really liked him. But that was probably maybe four years ago. But we were like, oh, he's just so young, and we didn't know. Like, I mean, when I was, you know, in my early twenties, I was a nightmare of a person. And I was like, I just don't. We didn't know about him. We we're like, is he going to be like? you know partying and just like wild and we were just kind of concerned that he was too young oh, yeah. and then we played with a couple other people sort of temporarily and it got to the point where we we're like let's call douglas back and he was still interested and then he came down and moved to atlanta and joined the band and lived with me for probably six or seven months before he got a place and he's just a great guy and we've done a bunch of tour we've been we've done a couple uf tours with him now we did australia new zealand and uh, europe as well uh mainland europe and the uk with him so he's he just jumped right in like he was there nice. from the very beginning you know he's a good person he's a great drummer it's fun to be around you know great sounds like he's very yeah. seasoned now too you've, you've seasoned him well i think so okay i think so yeah <laughs> cool man um so let me uh let's jump into your your history uh where were you born and raised i was born in point pleasant beach which is like um jersey shore basically okay uh, my family my dad's from the city. He's from, was born in the Bronx. My mom is from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, I lived there till I was about five. And then we moved down to South Flo Southwest Florida, uh, hmm. Marco Island, which is where I grew up. Um, okay. And so I was there until I graduated high school and then went to college in North Carolina and then moved to Atlanta after that. And I've lived in Atlanta ever since but i do spend months on end in either new york and then sometimes <laughs> philly for i do like movie movie stuff uh, i'm in the trade union um mm. so if the band isn't working real hard there's a lot in atlanta too but um oh yeah there's a lot more in new york so it's easy you can just jump in and jump out and it's it fits my band schedule really well oh right sure yeah um so let's say you five you moved down to florida that's where you did the majority of your your childhood up sure. rear, uprearing i guess you can call it um <laughs> so what was uh what was the house like uh growing up i mean were your what was your experience with music as a kid um well, when we first moved down there we lived in an apartment um and i don't really remember a whole lot of music at that time um but then we started we got a house and I remember out on our porch, there was a stereo um, and and then inside there was like a boom box. And my dad was a big music fan. 
And mm-hmm. I had some of my, he's, he passed away a long time ago, but um, I remember he had a lot of um, cassettes because it was like the eighties, you know, and that was sort of the, um, what do you call it? Uh, format. Right. Yeah. That was the most popular. So he had a lot right. of, um, he liked BB King a lot. He liked Willie Nelson a lot. Um, sort of more kind of cla- what we'd consider kind of classic stuff. Classic now. rock. Um, not really classic rock, more, more soul R and B and, uh, not too much country. Willie Nelson was, was one of those mm. Titans that kind of transcends genre. I think, yeah. um, yeah, he's sure. sort of a superstar, you know, oh, yeah. but, um, my mom had some of my mom's records from when she was younger. My, my parents are very, or were very, uh, different. My mom was 25 when I was born and my dad was 50. So there was a huge generational gap, which is also why my father passed away when I was a teenager, um, because he was a lot older than my mom. Right. But um, I got a couple of my mom's records. I got the Beatles Help, which was hers. um, And I got the Rolling Stones sort of, it's not really a greatest hits, but kind of, it's just called Through the Past Darkly. And then also got the Rolling Stones, um, the, uh, what was it? The live one with like all the, the, the repeating faces on it boy i can't even remember which one it was oh live one i mean not hot rocks oh hot rocks that's what i meant yeah yeah, yeah okay is that not live is that just the greatest hits as well i think it's just the greatest hits really okay yeah um yeah i remember that i remember hearing uh a gimme shelter i think is on that i remember hearing that for the first time and being the lord and, and what, uh, what I, when do you how old do you think you were when that happened um probably like eight something okay. like that like maybe yeah second third grade something like that yeah um yeah and then i really get into the rolling stones um a little later in life and and weirdly i was one of those jerks who thought that not liking things was a personality when i was really young you know Mm -hmm. i just thought that what i like to find me as a person so i completely wrote off the beatles which i know that sounds insane but uh kid i mean you know i just hated them and now like (laughs) i you know when we were recording this last record ryan had the um the Disney plus Beatles, like, you know, extravaganza just kind of on a loop. And I started watching it and I am 100% in, I think they are the greatest, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. And really got into the, you know, the, the sort of the different eras of the band, even though it was a very short window of time, but I'm definitely right. team Beatles now, man. I get it. You know? Sure. Sure. I mean, that was a eye opening thing for, for everybody uh, over the decades. Cause I mean, it was a very, intimate look inside of the writing process and the recording process for them and that's what i relate to i mean it's all the fanfare and all the celebrity and all that stuff i have no you know touchstone for but i understand being in studio well that's the Uh, thing it was like they they didn't have any of that there wasn't like any of the like there was very very little of paparazzi shit or celebrity appearances or anything like that it was like them at work yep having like, having tea and toast and yeah it was yeah and the cool thing is you can kind of put it on and let it play yeah. and you don't really have to pay rapt attention to it you can just kind of key in when you want to because it's so long it's it's like sort of like the podcast medium when it feels like you're hanging out with someone it's very cool you know yeah yeah I re- that really was the, the turning point for me and i've since gotten a lot of their stuff on vinyl um rubber soul I love um, Revolver. I love uh, White Album. I love Heavy hmm. Road. I've gotten a bunch. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm completely into them now. And I used to always think it was all about John. Nah, dude, it's Paul. It's all about Paul. Clearly, yeah. the band yeah. leader. You know? Yeah, but it, I mean, all of them, all of them have their their moments. You know, George Harrison and even Ringo Starr, as goofy yeah. as he might seem sometimes. I mean, he's the right drummer for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a very lyrical drummer which i don't think people realize people think it's just backbeat it's like he understood how to do one hit and then just lay back and so many musicians are incapable of holding back i mean Mm. particularly young musicians they want to just play to the to the to the level to the limits of their ability which is the dumbest thing ever you know maturity comes like restraint so hard you have to you can't be taught it you have to learn it on your own and he was very good at that you know at a young age right um Speaking of uh, being at a young age, let's go, let's go back to you in Florida. So you're uh, around eight years old. You're hearing Stones. Uh, what is your interest as a young kid, like in making music? Like when did that kind of turn around for you, or when did that become apparent? Uh, I remember a f- 
friend of mine got me the first Van Halen album on vinyl when I was well, probably 10. Um, it's probably my fifth fifth grade birthday party. So I remember getting that and just thinking that it was, I've said this a lot, so I kind of feel dumb repeating it, but it felt magical. Like sure. to, hear, do, to hear someone do that with a guitar, it completely just split my mind open. Um, hmm. This is way before punk, way before, you know, what you'd call metal or any kind of outsider music. Um, hearing that, just I was obsessed with Van Halen for a long time uh, throughout junior high school. Okay. And uh, that's definitely when it when it really started. And I, I wanted a guitar so badly. Um, I was... <laughs> I was trying to like a couple different times I would get pieces of wood in the garage and like try to stretch like rubber bands and, and like tie them on, on a nail on either side and try to make like a, I wanted one so badly for so long. Um, I didn't end up getting one until I was about 13, but I thought about it obsessively until I got one. And to this day, I'm obsessed with guitar and I'm not a, a you know, a real player's player or anything, but I love it so much. I've already mm. played guitar today, you know? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed with it. Uh, huh. So Van Halen was absolutely the first thing that made me go like, Holy smokes, mm. this is amazing. You know? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, so from an early age, it was always guitar. Like there was no other instrument that you kind of considered. No, I mean, I was in school band and stuff, but that, that was, it was almost like a separate thing. It does it had nothing to do with music to me you know, right. playing three blind mice or something. I was like, that's, I didn't connect with it. I just did it because everybody else did it. I didn't sure. care about it. You know, it was always guitar though, for sure. It wasn't the worst of the subjects to be stuck in, in school, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. we had a fun music teacher and then there was the music <clears throat> teacher in, in high school was really fun as well. And you know, a cool guy or whatever, but that was in my, I've never even really thought about it explicitly, but that was completely separate things from playing in my own band to music at school. Might as well have been, you know, sports or something. It's just right. not related. <laughs> it's yeah. weird. All right. So when do things get weird? Well, I mean, I had a similar experience that a lot of people had in that, uh, you know, you hear in the broadest of terms, punk rock, and then you, you have the, aha, I can do that moment because, you know, the wizardry of Eddie Van Halen is not something anyone can do it's it's something very 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 few people can do and it's sort of unapproachable i've never had a guitar lesson in my life hmm. not because i didn't want one i just it wasn't available to me so i mean it's just, i just never took any um but i remember hearing you know minor threat and it just it has another one of those moments where you just it speaks to you on a personal level and i just thought like these are kids my age and I can do this because they're doing it and I could figure out those songs, how to play them, you know? And it was, uh, yeah. And a lot of people have had that same experience. You know, I remember I got into skateboarding, like a lot of kids at that time. And then, you know, the two Kings back then were trans world and thrasher and trans world was the glossy magazine, but thrasher was like the more punk magazine. It was kind of on newsprint in the back. They'd have ads for like misfits stuff and like, you could order Doc Martens through the mail because you couldn't get them in the store back then. Like it's, mm -hmm. it was not like it is now. So Thrasher Magazine introduced me to a lot of punk. And then once I started latching on to um, a band, I would basically buy anything on the label that that band was on, assuming that it would be similar and just pre-internet, of course. So just this band is on this label. I'll, you know, I'll, check out everybody else in this ad and see what I have money for and just mm. started mail ordering records like a psycho, you know, when I was in probably early high school. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And that set me on the path. And then I started playing in bands and started writing songs and all that stuff. Okay. And what, it's how weird old were you, how you come at it from the, I'm sorry, what? How old were you at that time? Like you said high school, but probably 14. So that's yeah. when you're starting to like play and starting to write your own material and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I had a band in junior high with two of my friends and we were all writing our own songs. Um, but that was more, I was kind of more into uh, like, I like the cure a lot and still do, but that was when, because I mean, back then, like all these different styles of music were under the same umbrella of just weird shit because mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, top 40 and it wasn't on the radio. So People were into 
the cure and also into minor threat and they're stylistically so different but what they have in common is that they're not top 40 music you know right um so i was into more like a lot of euro kind of stuff i loved love and rockets um at that age but once i started getting into punk um yeah i loved uh, minor threat was probably my favorite band when i was that age and then uh went to dc on a high school trip once and went to a a, like a store there and bought a ton of punk t-shirts and just like wore them every single day and washed them on the weekends and like i was in i've got some pretty great pictures of me from that time with like crazy hair and you know wearing like punk t-shirts for my yearbook picture and stuff i mean i was obsessed yeah um, cool yeah so the gateway was for really thinking that i could do it was was thrasher and and punk and huh. and all that stuff yeah Okay. And and what years was that? Let's see. That was probably 86. Something okay. Like that. Okay. Yeah. So we got a, we got a few years before uh this helmet album comes out. Uh yeah, meantime. for sure. Yeah. So what uh what led you to helmet? Like how did you get to that point? Um so in high school I was into, you know, punk stuff and definitely into some of the post punk kind of stuff like like the cure and um then I went to school in North Carolina, college, and the college radio station there was fantastic. And I'd never even heard college radio before because down in Southwest Florida, there are mm. no college. I mean, there is now. There is a university there now, but there never was. I mean, the closest thing was like Gainesville. And a lot of my friends from high school actually went to Gainesville to play in bands and stuff. Um, so I started hearing what people have sort of named retroactively noise rock you know which people a lot of say a lot of people will say they confuse it for like noise for like Mersbau and stuff it's not that <laughs> it's a different thing mm -hmm. so i started hearing you know this is right around when grunge was kind of happening like early 90s so i on that radio station yeah there was the big bands the you know and the nirvanas and the Soundgarden and stuff and i like those bands for sure but i'd also hear like tad and melvin's and it started leading me towards like okay there's big big guitar music that's being made by people who are not idiots and prior to that it was kind of like big guitar music was like hair metal and just stuff that which i loved when i was a little kid but once you kind of grow out of that and see how corny it is like yeah i completely right disavowed that stuff and now as an adult i can go back and be like some of those rap guitar riffs are sick <laughs> or, you know what i mean like yeah, yeah, but yeah. as a punk I, I was not allowed to like it so you know right right that's the thing but you, the you college radio station the... played a lot of that i'm sorry i interrupted you no again, that's okay but... you, you latched onto the punk ethos therefore you could not admit to you know having right. any association with the 80s hair metal right and then you grow out of that as an adult and you're like i can i'm allowed to like whatever i want to like it doesn't define me as a person you know you can right. appreciate it of course stuff but um i think i probably heard helmet on college radio for the first time and i didn't hear strap it on i heard meantime first and then went back and got the born annoying ep and got um strap it on as well but um just i remember hearing the the in the meantime the sort of title track for that record and there's this big opening and it's drop d tuning so i had heard Van Halen has a song Unchained that's in Drop D. So I had heard it once before, but I'd hmm. never heard it big chords with that dropped tuning, which is what I do. To, I do drop C tuning, but it's the same shape. So you oh, can okay. play a bar chord with one finger, essentially. I do to this day, I do that. And like, that's the first time I'd really heard big, big, chunky riffs with stops and starts um, and being. I've said this before too. It's it it at the time occurred to me that it was sort of intentionally, for lack of a better word, intentionally kind of dumb music played by pretty smart people. Mm -hmm. Where and the opposite of that is terrible. Like dummies who are trying to make smart music. It sounds like Guitar Center kind of prog tech metal. I cannot stand that shit. Um, but it seemed to me that they were pretty smart dudes. And the fact that it was on college radio made me think that they were probably pretty smart people who are intentionally kind of getting back to what, in my mind, rock and roll is. And that simplicity is a part of that equation for me. When it gets okay. too fancy, I don't like it. Um, hmm. I, li I like jazz music. I like classical music. I like surf guitar quite a bit. And they're all pretty, um, you know, pretty technically... Um, 
advanced musicians playing that music and i really enjoyed that but i don't like it in rock music for so i mean i guess that's probably growing up on punk but hmm. but okay. like i love the white stripes you know which, which might surprise people but um the simplicity of that band is 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 exactly what I, I don't play music like that but man do i love it you know hmm. um, okay I don't well, it's know. Funny. It's funny that you mentioned the the you know appreciation for for jazz and and classical and sure. even even surf, but um, but uh, you know, comparing that or at least like the connection of that to Helmet is that um, Paige Hamilton Paige. is actually a classically trained musician and uh, and cites uh, often that uh, jazz was like a major influence on him, you know, uh, to to influence what he writes for Helmet. Absolutely. Yeah, I knew that he was, uh, you know, doing that Glenn Branca stuff and doing, you know, was in music school and like, definitely. And I don't really care for the solos in Helmet's music, but I don't really care for guitar solos anyway. So that's not really like sure. a deal breaker for me. It's, you know, at the time and for many years, it was about the riffs for those songs. Mm. As an adult, it kind of and I keep saying coming back to that point, but I really kind of like in the last 10 years or so sort of been able to start seeing myself as an adult and not a young adult or not um i don't know which just kind of occurred to me yeah. fairly fairly recently that um i've just changed as a person and uh as an adult it's about the drums that john stainer's i mean a master that guy oh, is yeah. so good how will like do it and a, it's a it's a showcase on that record how he'll play a syncopated beat with the riff and then just start chopping wood on the twos and fours, but the riffs stays the same. I love that stuff. And he's so good at it, you know, and there's yeah. like this weird internal sort of counting that happens with some of those riffs where um, if you're not like in the loop of it, you'll get lost. And it, but it's deceptive because it just right. sounds like four on the floor rock and it's not man. Right, there's right. all sorts of stuff rhythmically happening with that band. Um, yeah. And he's a huge part of that, you know? Right. Oh, absolutely. And, and so that's what I would kind of wanted to ask you about. I mean, like, you know, maybe not in the 92 when this came out but do you listen to helmet now and can you hear that jazz influence can you can you tell like different time signatures and stuff like that i can now yeah um i used to not i wasn't i wouldn't consider myself a sophisticated musician now but i do consider myself a somewhat sophisticated sophisticated listener the irony of pronouncing that word wrong is pretty funny but um yeah, I can, I can hear it now because if I hear something that I can tell isn't 4-4, four, four, I try to count it. Like, is that in sevens? Is that in eights? Is that in sixes? Like, what's going on? Hmm. Um, okay. So I can definitely hear some of that stuff. Uh, and then also a lot of his guitar solos sound somewhat atonal, but I, I guarantee they're not. I'm sure it's like accidental notes that are intentionally there. And I'm sure because of his jazz background, I'm sure there's he could explain it to you like why it sounds the way it does, you know? Oh yeah, um, and and he does yeah. too. Like I, I've yeah. I've obviously done a lot of research to to lead up to today, and and read a lot and listened to a lot of his interviews, and he's very in in depth this, about that stuff, and so much so that it loses me because I I'm not technically Same. proficient at all. I don't I don't know what chords are like when he mentions like diminished and and uh, yeah, I don't either. Yeah, all that shit. The Dorians. I'm like I don't know what the right. fuck you mean. <laughs> Heard the word before, but I don't know what any of that stuff. For, yeah. for Aegean, I don't, I don't know a single scale, and I'm not proud of that. I wish I did. I'd like to know all that stuff. I've just never taken the time to do it because I'm busy writing songs, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so and and that's the thing is this like I mean, I guess it's it's more important to just write something that you feel good about, you feel excited about more so than like is this challenging me as a musician? Right, and those are sort of different streams, you know. And I can't really be in a band with people who aren't lovers of the song because it that's what i do you know right um and if people have to do something that challenges them that's great but that's not what this what my band is you know yeah it's just not about that it's about gut gut level stuff not head stuff you know sure sure i mean and 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 i guess that you could say that that kind of comes off when you listen to it because you know like i was saying before i mean it just just it's just balls to the wall crazy music and it's just great i mean i can <laughs> I just can't wait to get into a club to see you guys when you're, oh, when you're cool. on tour. Because I live? know oh, I live in Rhode Island. Rhode Island. We're not coming to Rhode Island. That's a bummer. Because yeah, we have gonna... a tour coming up. It's just not announced yet. Okay. But, but you're uh, probably going to go, go to Boston, probably. We had Boston on the routing, but I think we may have taken it off because we have a couple things that are on either, either end of the tour that are already confirmed. 
So oh, we're okay. sort of beholden to that as far as routing goes. However, we are going to do a second U.S. tour and hit a lot of the places we're not hitting on this first tour, probably in the fall. This one that we have coming up is uh, starts in May and goes through most of June. But then I think we're going to do another one in the August, September in the fall. And then mm -hmm. probably Europe in October where we just started booking that too. So we'll see. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll figure it out at some point. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll catch you guys. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, as far as this album is concerned, wait, so 1992 is when it came out. Uh, you're yeah. in college is when you first hear it. Um, yeah. Why did you choose this album? Well, when the opportunity came up, I was thinking like, I like a lot of, music i mean i have a lot of records and i'm not a collector per se i'm a listener i i can look at a cool first pressing whatever and think that that's cool but i don't usually buy stuff like that i buy copies that i can listen to you know um mm -hmm. so i do have like a ton of records um i don't even remember what the question was now because i started thinking about all my records <laughs> <laughs> what did you just what, ask me why did you choose this one to talk about today um, okay because i feel like that's the one that's the record that people can see a very clear line from our band to that record okay. um i like i would say my favorite band ever is probably the birthday party which i don't mm. think people can hear in our music um i had a period where i was absolutely obsessed with them <laughs> um and i have everything they put out um including like the peel sessions on vinyl um i have all the eps i have like literally everything <laughs> um yeah. but i don't think and i think that was maybe one of the ones i'd sent like as a possible one but i really don't think people could connect that to our band because we don't sound mm. like that at all um sure and I, the the two things that people usually say about our band are are you know helmet and like either the melvins or helmet and the jesus lizard but it's usually helmet is in there so i figured that mm. that made the most sense and it was formative but i never really thought of it as formative until the opportunity to do this interview came up and i, I really did some like what is the what is what are the records that that people are gonna that people can understand because i love that i can give you a perfect example of this so there's a song on our last record called Participation Trophy that the main riff in the song, the riff we start with, goes like da na 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 na, right? But then the verse riff of that same song does that same rhythm, but it doesn't do the the up and down notes. It just goes da 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 da. That's helmet all day. That is right. what they do, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I didn't realize that I was taking that from them, but I do it all the time. I find a cool riff and then go, okay, what's the simplest version of that riff can, that I can also play to kind of A, B with this, you know? Right. And that's, I learned that from Helmet without even knowing it, you know? Yeah. Subconsciously, huh? Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely happened. And like, I like some of their, some of their other records too. Um, I mean, I like them a lot actually, but actually the, fellow who's playing drums in the band now we spoke to about playing in our band um probably five years ago we had like a nice conversation and he was interested but you know he couldn't move to atlanta and obviously obviously helmet would be his first loyalty as it should be mm -hmm. um so if we had conflicts he would have to defer to them and i can't have a person like that in my band right. just can't and you know we need where we split everything evenly, we split all the credit evenly, all the money gets split and com completely evenly, and it needs to stay that way. Hmm. Uh, I would never want someone as a hired gun um, who wasn't, who wouldn't share in the success and failures of the band. It just doesn't work otherwise. You know, sure. He's a great drummer. Um, Black Stevenson is his like Instagram handle, or whatever. Super nice guy. Um, oh, okay. And he's currently playing for Helmet. You're saying he is? Yeah, he's been in the band for a while. He's out in L.A. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a great drummer too. And like I said, a super nice guy. We actually submitted too for a helmet tour that's coming up. We didn't get it. Cromags are the the band that got it who are legends. So like I'm not mad about it, you know, but yeah. I'd love to tour with them. It would make sense. You know? Yeah, I would love to see that for you. Seriously, that would be great. Um, you know, uh a couple things from from you saying that. First of all, I don't think that the choice of album that you speak about uh for something like this matters i think that 
you can go as weird as you want as long as you felt like it was something that was seriously like you know pivotal to like your your uh, or or informative to you know what you end up doing i mean yeah there's definitely a connection there i mean i definitely you know listen to helmet listen to this album and see like oh yeah this 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 fits in with horrors like really well sure sure but uh but i love those contrasts i love it when like you know i talk to somebody and they're like they pick out a jazz record i'm just like this is yeah. really fucking challenging and it doesn't sound like anything you do but it's really cool and i and i love to see you know kind of how that how that does connect you know i think the best musicians are listeners first i mean i think a lot of people who are musicians that just sort of plow through and everyone that just has to keep up with them are not interested in them but yeah. when there's a musician that is clearly making micro adjustments and listening to what's going on around them those are the best musicians because then you don't get multiple things happening simultaneously you get one thing because everyone is doing these little micro adjustments um Matt, like I've seen the Jesus Lizard do that live. I've seen Fugazi do that live where if you choose to, you can pick out one thing and listen to it. But it sounds like one big machine moving forward. Sure. And that's listening to each other, not playing, listening. Um, I love Jason Isbell and the 400 unit. Hmm. Probably my favorite songwriter right now. I think okay. he, I think he's probably the best singer songwriter in the world right now. Um, hmm. He's hitting a stride that's just incredible. I think in you know 50 years time he's going to be revered the way that willie nelson is he's phenomenal yeah, and i don't probably. think people would know that about me if they weren't connected to me on social media but i sing his praises every couple of weeks i'm like y'all seriously jason isbell like monster yeah. player monster songwriter really a big gearhead like myself um yeah i listen to a ton of his music and i actually just started another uh another band that's got nothing to do with jason isbell but um i i'm thinking about doing some different things stylistically too not not quite that far i would love to be able to write what is called country music but the last thing i want to do is ever come off as a fraud or as i'm trying too hard and i don't want to do something just really? because i'm fascinated with it you know well no i mean see that's the thing i was just i was just about to ask you because you were talking about jason isbell and i'm just like okay yeah. so obviously you have like these interests that are that are outside of like noise rock and hard rock yeah. and metal and shit and and you know as as most music fans do right i mean we don't all just listen to one thing and that's it yeah. but um but i was gonna ask you like i mean have you ever considered doing something differently or or are you even interested or or, or can you do something different like have yeah. you ever tried to write like something that was outside of like a, a hard rock or metal song. Yeah, I've um so in my phone I have uh no uh notes uh entry that's like lyrics, you know, potential lyrics. I'll think of a song or I mean a a phrase or you know a couple lines that rhyme whatever put it in there. But I have a second one too that's not related to the band. That's also for lyrics that just says solo lyrics, you know? I don't know what it's for yet, but hmm. it's just different. Um I was doing right before COVID, I was doing a band with a friend of mine from Atlanta and we were kind of doing more. I like Wilco a whole ton too. I know as like a straight white middle-aged male, I'm contractually obligated to like Wilco, but even, even though that would make me want to not like them, they're so good that it surpasses any of that bullshit. Yeah, um, I love great. them. I would love to do a band like that. I got a, um, uh, Jeff Tweedy, the singer Wilco, plays um, what's called a parlor guitar. A lot of times it's a little bit smaller acoustic mm -hmm. guitar. I got a silver tone parlor guitar pretty recently because of him. Um, I like Elliot Smith a whole bunch. Um, so I was doing this band that kind of sounded, we were trying, I was trying to do like kind of a Wilco kind of esque band. Hmm. But then once we actually started doing stuff, it started sounding like PIL <laughs> or oh. like it's weird. Like yeah. I come at it from one way and it just doesn't, it, I just, I don't know how that stuff happens, you know, right. so it didn't say I had no roots at all. It was like this really cold, sterile music, which is the opposite of this warm, intimate, you know, hmm. Americana or whatever. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. I would like to, I know I can't do the style of music I'm doing right now forever because it takes so much out of you physically. Hmm. And I've been injured pretty seriously a couple different times um from being wild on tour and just jumping around and stuff and screaming you lose your voice and all that stuff so i i'm sort of scared to to try doing that stuff but i really want to i've got a hmm. an electric piano at home that's sort of a poor man's fender roads that i plink around on and yeah. you know i i'd like to 
try to start doing that stuff with, you know, the problem is you can't think about it. You have to actually do it. And to, you know, to create something real, there's, and, and good and honest and, and compelling. There's so many pieces of dog shit that you've got to wade through before you get to that. And I'm just kind of scared of it. I think hmm. but I really want to do it. You know, I'd love to turn yeah. into Mark Lanigan or Nick Cave or something, you know, in my, in the elder statesman status, sure. I would love to do something like that. Um, all right. The, the thing is just, you have to do it, you know, and I'm sure I will do a ton of it before I show anyone any of it, you know? Okay. Well, uh, I'm happy to hear it. I mean, I, I'm, I'd be happy to, to, you know, listen to it too, at some point, yeah. whenever, whenever it's, it's ready. Yeah. A friend um, and I were just talking about guided by voices who I also love and like, they, you know, put out so much stuff and Robert Pollard's solo stuff. He puts out so much stuff and my band puts out very few things, but I also can stand behind every one of those songs is good. Like I don't, I will not put it out if I'm not behind it. And that's not because it's the only songs we wrote. It's because there's 30 of them that aren't up to snuff, you know? Hmm. Okay. Uh, that's great. Yeah. And it's just a different way of coming, coming at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's get back into uh helmet for a little bit. Cause um, yeah. can I say as far as like, as far as recordings go and, and what I've been subject to, to do the research for today, mm -hmm. um, it's been more enjoyable to listen to your music than it has been to this helmet album. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, in Ours 92, is more modern sounding though, technically, as far as the recording, you know, it's not dated. Whereas they are sort of as a product of the eighties and nineties and the recording sounds that way. It, a little bit. I mean, like, you know, some of the, some of these songs, I think like, you know, 92, I, I was 12 years old. Okay. Sure. And, but I do remember when this came out and I remember specifically, obviously the MTV video for unsung and I did yeah. like it. I was just like, holy shit, that band is like fucking mind blowing because they're really, they had really short heavy. hair and stuff and they're wearing shorts. You're like, what is happening with this band? Oh, yeah. 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 Disassociation, like, you know, kind of like from the aesthetic of of, of their visual is, is, yeah. is, you know, silly. But I mean, the music was great and I thought it was, it, it was very heavy for the time for, oh, yeah. you know, for MTV and, and radio music. Um, so I definitely was interested and I definitely liked it, but I don't think I've ever listened to this whole album straight through. Sure. So I've been listening to it a lot now and I know it fairly well. And I do think it hasn't aged great. Like, I think there are some songs here that I'm just like, that sounds like something I would have written then. You know, it's like, right. it, it just, it sounds 90s. It sounds a little dated and not, not recording yeah. wise, like, well, quality wise. I don't think, I think it sounds fine. I think it holds I up. I mean, the arrangements and the riff choice and stuff. And just some of it, like lyrically, some of it, like yeah, some it's of it never it, really it, influenced me lyrically. It's only the music that's influenced me. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, and I can see that. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it's it's a good album overall. I think that I, uh, you know, it's growing on me. And I and I did go back and listen to everything else. I listened to the first album because I was just like, oh, they. I didn't know that they had a album before this one. Great, it's really. great. And then yeah. I listened to Betty again, which I really like Betty a lot. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Overall, pretty great band. I'm I'm happy to have gotten into it. Uh, let's let's. I tackle... heard they got some obscene amount of money for that record from from whoever their label was. Interscope and like was millions, it... man. Like I mean, that's mm. right at the tail end of getting actual record deals. I mean, right. we had a quote unquote big record deal, and it was like twenty grand. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and there just aren't even six figure deals anymore. I mean, sure, Cardi B. Right. Whatever. Sure. But I'm talking about regular musicians right. that don't exist anymore, I, man. I don't even know Forever. how the major label industry works now. Like as far either. as that's concerned, like signing yeah. people and like cause... they must take huge pieces of their of their merchandise and huge pieces of their even probably live performance fees. And right. It's got to be. There's no other way. Right. So just to speak to what you were asking, um, Interscope Records sign. Ultimately, if they've agreed to sign with Interscope, they wanted to be on Warner Brothers or at least Page wanted to be on Warner Brothers. Yeah. But ultimately, Interscope won out, uh, offering them 1.2 million. There you go. But that was over the course of three records. Oh, okay. so so technically, you know, recording budgets were like four hundred thousand dollars a record. Yeah. So that's still big. I mean, it's still a lot, but uh, it's not not as massive. But it definitely was a big one at the time. And I mean, it never is. People, uh, you people just see the the dollar amount, and they don't really do the math of what production costs are i mean even for our live shows i mean say say we get a hundred dollars ten dollars of that immediately goes to our agent 
fifteen dollars of that immediately goes to our manager. Mm-hmm. Travel costs, um, gas, uh, the hotel room that we don't even get. You know, we certainly don't get separate hotel rooms or anything. We you know stay in a room. Um, food, all of that stuff, all said and done, we probably come home with about thirty seven dollars to split. So sure. it's just how it is, man. And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying people have no idea what it costs. Oh, yeah. And sometimes, uh, you know, I've heard people like talk smack about us saying like, oh, they won't play unless it's this amount. It's like, well, yeah, I don't have a 401k. I don't even have a savings account, dude. I have a checking account. Like this is my life. It's I don't I purposely don't have, you know, uh, a mortgage and a wife and children and all of these things that most people my age have because music so far has come first. Um, Yeah. And in order to do it at that level and to play around the world and to do all these things, it costs money, man. It yeah, costs man. money. It's not yeah. people try to wave this punk rock flag. And it's like, dude, you have a design job and you make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Like as far as the IRS is concerned, I made like 20 grand last year. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. but they're waving the punk rock flag. I'm like, how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> you know, and just because you have a sleeve of tattoos doesn't make you a punk. It just doesn't, man. Right. You know, no, man, so, you got to live it. You got to walk. We had walk. a song about that on the last record um, about that very thing about wearing the the uniform, you know, and not really being down for it. It's, it makes me insane. I, I bet, man. I mean, because it, it, especially because you're going through it. And so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's super frustrating, I'm sure. I mean, Ryan has always recorded our records for us on spec. It's called where we don't exchange any money. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we pay him afterwards. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating. So we took a lot of time for this record. We had someone else playing drums initially and threw that entire thing out. We didn't use a single second of it, Mm -hmm. wrote a couple new songs, got rid of some other ones, re-recorded every single thing. And it it took a lot of time, you know, and he's a, he's not like some dude, he is a legit professional with an incredible resume and he just loves our band. So he does it out of love. And like, he is a partner in our band. And I think if we start self-releasing, I've already talked to my bandmates about this. We're going to cut Ryan in like he's a member of the band. We're just going to split it four ways. He's that important to us, you know? Mm. Wow. Um, That's great. But without him, we would have to spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to record a record that we don't have. So our band wouldn't exist without him, you know? It really right. wouldn't. Right. And not at the level that it's at, which is not that great, but it's something you know that's, yeah i mean it's pretty great for for what it is man i mean for for being an, an independent artist i mean mm-hmm. and and i don't know maybe that's speaking to what you're saying as as being like oblivious to what it costs to to live and to to work as, as a band but i mean yeah it looks pretty good i mean it looks like you guys are selling the record so that's the first and foremost the most important thing you know yeah the, you're, you're getting those records sold because that's a fucking feat these days as yeah it is. yeah i mean I think part of that is because it was so long between our two records and there are a host of different reasons why Hmm. that happened. And a friend of ours has uh, shot a documentary about the band and about the path to this new record that'll come out after the record comes out. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, there's just a lot of different things, a lot of life stuff that happens when you're not 22 um, that makes it uh, a lot more challenging to play in a band at a professional level when you're not making, you know, loads and loads of money doing it um, right but i wouldn't have it any other way man i i think about it so you know when i'm going to sleep i'm like humming riffs in my head and i can hear it or if i listen to audible a lot and if i'm listening to a, a book that you know has an interesting turn of phrase i'll like wake up put my glasses on and type it into my phone you know like but it's all in the service of music you know mm-hmm. yeah what you and just really said there it. What you just said there about, you know, like, you know, hearing stuff in your head, I was wondering, um, so in my research, I, I found a thing that, about Paige Hamilton saying that, uh, you know, that uh, that he when he wrote Repetition, the song Repetition that's on the first album, uh, yeah. he heard he, he heard it in his head and he heard yeah. like the drop D tuning. Um, cool. Like he dropped, he heard that that D chord. Yeah. So he went home and drop tuned his guitar and he basically found the song that he was right. hearing in his head. That's exactly uh, how it happens. Yeah. You got to find that, the notes because you can hum it, you can hear it, but you've got to hunt, uh, you know, peck, hunt and peck or whatever to find the. And a lot of times it's just like open three, five, and it's like some nonsense. But that being mm-hmm. said, that song in the meantime is open three, five, and it's very compelling and it's the most basic shit ever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's open three, five, and then it, it's all, which is, you know, the two dot, the first two dots on the guitar. Um, 
And then there's like another part that's just open, but it's just the rhythm of it. You know, it's so simple. And to make something that is awesome, that is also simple, is tough. There's only yeah. 12 notes. And we've been doing, you know, this kind of music for maybe 70 years tops. Mm -hmm. So like there's a lot of the ideas are getting used up, man. Oh, and yeah, to be yeah. able to do something with that little is so much more difficult than doing something fancy that you're just pasting all this crap together. Right. Um, that drop D, I when I get a new turntable, I've gone through a couple. Um, I I use the record to tell if my turntable is too fast or too slow because that big it has that you know the big kind of uh, messy kind of part at the beginning and then just hits the big open chord and the drum beat starts. That big open chord is a D. Hmm. So if you if your record player is playing that, you can actually use a tuner. And if it's too fast, the D will be a little sharp. If it's too slow, the D will be a little flat. Oh, so you damn. can tune your record player using that song. Oh, very cool. cool. Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask you about the the whole drop D tuning thing. I mean, like, so, you know, so he found that that was kind of a revelation for him because then he, he basically never went back from that point. So Same. is there something that, something that you discovered that helps you write? I'm trying to think of if it was literally them that I started um doing doing that drop d stuff because i think i've been doing it that shape at least we're a full step down from there but it's the same shape same chord shapes um mm -hmm. i think i have i think i've been doing it since then um so that's a long time man that's like 30 years i've been doing that you know yeah it's weird to think of uh every guitar i own is tuned to that we had a song on the clean ep that was a different tuning that was even lower than that um you know the band torch i've heard of them i haven't heard them they're great um but uh they're no they broke up but they have this tuning that's basically standard tuning but the lowest string is tuned down to an a so it's two a strings together but an octave apart yeah so it's like that tuning but dropped another step so it's two g's it's g and g um we just call it the torch tuning um it's that has that tuning on that song every single other song we've recorded has been in the drop it's drop c for us mm -hmm. every single one every one of my guitars is tuned to that it's how i play guitar do you yeah. know what i mean like yeah. a couple times when i've picked up a guitar at a music store i just go and tune it down immediately first thing um because that's sort of how i think of the instrument in a weird way which is probably not great from a player standpoint but it's working for me and it's what yeah. feels comfortable and uh yeah, I don't know if it was them specifically because a lot of bands were doing it at the time. I know Soundgarden had some stuff that was in Drop D. Um, I like them a lot too in like my mm. late teens. Um, yeah, I don't, it's such a part of me that I've never even really thought about it. It's hmm. a, what do you call it? A foregone conclusion. It just goes without saying that that's the tuning, you know? Sure. It's strange. Well, you, know? you found your thing, man. You know what I mean? Like, I that's, think so. That's, yeah. Like, it's your voice, I guess you could say, right? Yeah, I think so, without even realizing it. I think so, yeah. Hmm. Cool, man. Um, so let's get into this album. We're going to go track by track. We might skip a few, but uh, I basically have a question for almost every one of these songs. Okay. All right. So uh, first song is In the Meantime. So what I learned about this song, oh, for, first of all, let me just say this, that I, I a bitch and a pain in the ass to try to find information about this record and about these songs specifically. Like, Interesting. Like everything I've I've researched, it's all Paige Hamilton, of course, because you know it's it, it's his band, really. Yeah. He says the same thing. He he holds his cards really close to his chest. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Every interview is like he's saying the same thing. Interesting. And he's and as far as I can see, never has like mentioned each of these songs individually. I don't think of them individually, but I'll do my best. No, I'm just saying, like, as far as like you know, trying to find out about you know, the recording process and or where the song came from, like what was the inspiration, anything like that, like yeah. really, really hard to find. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. So that was pre-internet too, you know? So like, yeah. 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 Weird. But now, now, I mean, like, you know, he has all these, like the 30th anniversaries have, has happened since. And, you right. know, it's you think been... someone would have asked him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so in the meantime, uh, the song was recorded by Steve Albini and later remixed by Andy Wallace. Yeah, that's the Slayer guy. So that's why it has that big rock sheen on it. It's Andy Wallace, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Wallace's style of mixing, which involves, among other things, triggered samples and a cleaner, more polished sound, irritated yeah. Albini. Um, yeah, I'm sure it did. 
<laughs> this is the only song on the album engineered by Albini. And that is because the album version was actually the demo version that they had recorded um, wow. with him in at Chicago at Electric Audio, right? Yeah. Um, Page states that this is because the album uh, take recorded by Wharton Tears, who recorded the rest of the record, right. simply did not have the same immediacy as the Albini version. Yeah. So, uh, I understand which, that. Yeah. yeah. Which which do you think holds more sway with whores in the studio, sound quality or performance? Um, huh. Well, I don't really have to think too much about sound quality because I'm I'm really meticulous about gear and every piece of gear from like the pick to the speaker all the way through everything between those two things. I'm very into it. Um, we actually have a pedal coming out next couple of months too that uh i'm very excited about but yeah i'm really into that stuff so i don't have to think about that stuff too much mm. i also don't have to think about ryan because i trust him imp implicitly um and i will put in a take that i'm not 100 percent sure about and he has no problem saying like that's good enough we should move on or saying it's gonna be good when we get it <laughs> and i know i'm not done yet so I absolutely trust him um, as far as the 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 take itself. Um, so it's difficult to to separate the two, really. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let me ask you this I, then, because you because you mentioned this earlier, like how you you actually already ditched like thirty tracks. Yeah. Like sure. What what is the um, what determines what is a keeper and what isn't for you? The feeling. Yeah, the feeling of it for sure. Okay. Um, the excitement of it, you know, still because it's difficult because, I mean, you come up with this thing and you do a, you know, a voice memo or whatever, and it sounds like all oh, exciting. And then like the more times you play it, the shittier it gets. It's like, how do you capture that, that same swing, you know, right. and it's right. really difficult. There's the first song on our new record. Um, we were trying to figure out why we couldn't get the bounce of it. And it's because the times, the, not the time signature, the tempo we were using was actually half and we it was on the quarter notes and we needed to be using the tempo on the eighth notes, which is double of that. Hmm. Um, because without like the, you were just getting like, it was getting the quantization it's called, you know, the space between the notes was getting sloppy and it right. wasn't like starting and stopping. And there's all this technical shit to make it sound like, like it's not technical, you know? Um, right. And that does happen. And so, and I, you know, a lot of times I don't know what's happening. I don't understand why it doesn't have the same um, fire as it would have otherwise. But that's why I kind of try to surround myself with people who are more talented than I am. Uh, and I think I have. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's the feel is the most important thing for sure. And I try to because that's not something you can correct. Do you know what I mean? Right. If it's not there, it's not there. And you just can't keep adding shit to it to make it sound like it has real a real emotion to it. It's just it does or it doesn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess that's the kind of the point about this song and like and why they kept the Steve Albini version, because, yeah. you know, two reasons. One being, like like you said, the the first sometimes a lot of the times that first take that that first time you do something is kind of like yeah. the most exciting take that you'll yeah. ever get. Because then the more times you keep on doing it, just it just kind of keeps on losing something. It's wild. The riff yeah. that's in the first song on the new record, uh, which we've been playing that song live, but like the main riff in that song, that is not the verse, but kind of the, the, I guess the chorus or the theme kind of riff of the song. Casey and I had been playing for probably seven years. Just mm -hmm. the riff. And yeah. I was never able to hang something around it because... When I kept trying to add stuff to it, it was not as exciting as that original riff. But then when I came at it from the other side to say, like, that is the main thing. Additional stuff that you write should be supplemental. You shouldn't be trying to best that. And I did that same thing that I mentioned earlier, where the riff is like the riff goes. OK, but then the verse just goes. It's the same thing, but the simple version of it. Right. It works every time. Um, hmm. Yeah, but like the feel of that original riff with the octave that it has, the octave pedal that I use on it, um, without the feel being correct, it wasn't cool. And once we figured out the double time BPM thing, it 
locked right in immediately. Hmm. Um, and that, that got it, you know, it's weird. Yeah. But if it cool. didn't have the feel, it wouldn't be cool because our songs are not technically dazzling, man. If it has to have the feel, that's what I think I excel in. So yeah, without that, what are we even talking about? You know? Right. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next song, Iron Head. Yeah. Iron Head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, so this is one of those songs. Um, not, not, I don't have too much about it. I couldn't find too much about it, but I think it's sure. fair to say that it's not a lyrically sophisticated song nor album altogether. All He's a musician, I think. More, I think of myself more as a writer. You know, I mean, I have a journalism degree. I like, I'm obsessed with reading too. I use that word obsessed too much. I need to find a different word, but uh, hmm. yeah, he's more of a guitar player. You know, yeah, right. I mean, he has a great voice, but I mean, as far as a lyricist, I don't think it's bad. It's certainly like you know not anything cringy but i wouldn't i wouldn't refer to the lyrics listening to their music i'm thinking about how it makes me feel not what he's saying you know yeah, yeah. whereas oh. other bands it's all about what they're saying you know sure yeah of course bob dylan's great example he's a oh. terrible singer he's an amazing lyricist you know right well so so Ironhead. i mean what do you, what are your thoughts on this song i know in the chorus of that song it does a cool thing where it plays the open note and then does this sort of descending thing that gives it like this this, uh, I don't want to say sadness, but it gives it this darkness. Whenever you do a descending riff, it always sounds sort of evil. Um, yeah. And I've definitely used that too. <laughs> Ryan also mixes our records in addition to recording them. And um, he's, he's he mastered the new one as well. Um, and when we are mixing, we think about how does it sound on a nice stereo? Yes. How does it sound on nice studio speakers? Yes. How does it sound on your phone? How does it sound on earbuds? How does it sound in your car? Mm -hmm. How does it sound on your phone, but with actual good headphones? How does it sound on vinyl? The master for vinyl is, I don't know if this is obvious or not, is different than the master for, for digital and CDs because they're different, you know, they're different things. They need to be mastered differently. Um, so we always think about phone sound because it is the number one way people contact new music. And if you think it isn't, you're fooling yourself, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely for today. Oh, well, that's not a big deal. I mean, like I said, Ironhead, I'm, I don't really have anything for it anyway. Yeah. So uh, so let's just move on to the the next thing, which is uh, Give It. All right. So this is this one's kind of cool. I actually have uh, something I'd really like to ask you about this. Um, no idea what this song is about, but I do get this vibe based mostly on the ending, uh, mostly because of the lyrics. Uh, Self-help confidence. <laughs> Self-help, self-help confidence. Yeah. 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 To me, yeah, it sounds true. like he, he's referring to drinking because maybe, uh, yeah, because I mean, I know that Paige Hamilton is, is a kind of a big drinker. He's kind of has a, has a few stories that uh, about, uh, you know, drinking a lot. And, sure. um, but I know that you're not, you don't, you don't drink, right? No, I've been sober for 20 years. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, from your experience, what, what do you think is the misconception of that liquid courage? Um, I think it's different for everyone. I think that it depends on the individual. I mean, drinking was never really my thing. It was drugs are my thing. But if I drank, I would take drugs pretty much 100% of the time. So hmm. um, I'm um, to this day a member in good standing of a of a cult that helps other people get sober um, and keeps me sober. Um, so I think there is a myth about that cult. Um, and I think that maybe people outside of it think that we think it's the only path to sobriety, which nothing could be further from the truth. If mm -hmm. yoga works for you, you should do that. If, you know, going up to the mountaintop works for you, you should do that. If organized religion helps you, whatever helps you, whatever gets you there is what you should do. I mean, there's the, the entire thing is set up with zero rules that everything, every step is a suggestion. It's not do this. It's we did this and it worked. If you want to try it, it will also work for you. But there are no rules. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that stuff. Um, yeah. Drinking is strange because I'm around it so much and around drugs and stuff so much, too. Uh, just playing in, you know, bars or, or venues or whatever. It's, you know, we have a hospitality rider that has booze on it. And it's um because I've done the actual work and the, there's real pen to paper work not just thinking about it um i've luckily been placed in this position of neutrality where i can take it or leave it it doesn't bother me it doesn't upset me 
I don't long for it. Um, I'm in this kind of free area that, that comes with doing the work. Um, mm. So I think that's a myth about that. I don't really know myths about, about liquid courage and myths about drinking um, because it's been so long since I drank or used drugs or anything like that. Um, sometimes feels like a different lifetime, a different person altogether, not like a dream, but like a parallel yeah. reality where that person still exists somewhere and is out, you know, waving a sign at an intersection somewhere trying to get some money together to get high. Um, it's such a, I mean, I don't regret anything that happened in the past, um, but it's such a distant memory at this point, which is why I sponsor men who are trying to get sober is why I keep in touch with people who are, you know, real close to that because it reminds me of two things uh, that it's still out there and can get me if I'm not, if I don't maintain um, my sort of spiritual health for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that there are, are people who are suffering and me helping them ends up helping me. There's a lot of paradoxes in, mm -hmm. in the whole deal, but that's, that's a big one sure. where um, it me, I'm not doing something for someone. I'm doing something that was done for me freely and I'm paying it back. You know, yeah. that's it. Sure. That's it. I mean, but and it no, works. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and that's great. I, I, I really admire it. I, I you know, cause, uh, cause I'm not a sober person. Um, uh, but you know, I also don't consider it a problem for me, but that's, so yeah, this I mean, is, both this my is... bandmates drink and, you know, smoke weed and whatever. Yeah. Like it's, you know, I, I don't think everyone should be sober. I think that's another misconception. Right. If I could do it socially, you bet I, you bet I would, but I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I had knee surgery. I had a couple knee surgeries in the past couple of years <laughs> on both my knees. But when I had, I had to have pain medicine for after surgery because I had surgery Hmm. And my sister, I gave them to my sister and she would literally come over every six hours and give me one because as someone who's, uh, you know, recovered addict and alcoholic, I wouldn't take two. I would take six. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I can't, I can't be left to my own devices, man. I know how I'm made. I have zero illusions about that. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So you put things in the way to prevent you from doing that. That's all it right. is, you know? Now, what about the context of, of, playing music though like like you said your bandmates like will will still drink and smoke um oh sure yeah do you think that there is um like i think that the the maybe the maybe the youth the youthful thing like i know like thinking about myself as a kid when i was making music um you know it kind of just went hand in hand you were just like well, yeah. I, I can't i can't go out on stage if i haven't had a drink yeah you know? i mean what kind of i was what, certainly what like that before i got sober i mean i was playing i've been playing music since i was a little kid I didn't get sober till 2003. So I was certainly right. doing that, you know, before then. Um, I remember I was in a band for a while uh, that never played out, but it was uh, really a couple of really good mu musicians. And um, uh, I was at practice. I was taking uh, Valium. I had taken Valium and I drank an entire bottle of wine or champagne or something that I got from work. And then went and did Coke after that. And it's like, insanity a band before that i remember injecting cocaine in front of my bandmates at practice which is horrifying to think about they must yeah. have been like they, they i'm sure they were horrified um and i've since made amends to them and i'm still great friends with them to this day but uh yeah it is a big part of it man um drinking is a big part of it um like i said my bandmates drink but never once have i heard either one of them like being too drunk to play or or embarrassing us or you know doing something like that i mean no one drinks at practice uh which i didn't say they should or shouldn't it's mm -hmm. just no one does um you know and it's it's definitely a big part of most bands life but i also think that's it becomes a real problem with bands um yeah when you know when people are yeah a little fucked up and they're you know maybe they're they're judgment is a little impaired and they say stuff they shouldn't say and i think it causes a lot of problems man hmm. um it just it hasn't for us luckily i mean not yet you know I don't, but i also don't think either of my bandmates have a problem i think they're they they do their thing right. and it doesn't interfere with what the band is doing you know right. and if it did it would be a problem and it would have to be addressed but it hasn't yet so right yeah so that's the thing about like you know 
socially uh, consuming anything, alcohol or drugs, is just the like, you know, there, there's a there's a line where you can't cross because yes. like, like my wife is sober now, but it's not because she had a problem. And then right. she she actually even hates saying that she's sober to people because right. she's just like, if I say I'm sober, someone's just like, oh man, like, w w like how bad was it for you? It's just like, it's not, they it wasn't bad at all. Right. Yeah. Didn't have a problem. I just didn't want to start. I just didn't want to drink anymore. Right. So well, when I'm not, when I'm just speaking casually with people, I don't use the word sober because I don't like want to make them uncomfortable and get into right. a whole thing. I just, you know, cause like people will come up at shows and be like, let me buy you a shot or, or let me buy you a drink, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. But I used to say, oh, I don't drink. But now I'm like, man, I don't. I, they're trying to do something nice for you. You don't want to make them feel bad. Yeah. Well, so just now I just say, like, how about a Red Bull or something? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. You don't want to put people in a position because it's my thing. It's not anybody else's thing. I don't I shouldn't put it on them, you know? Right. Right. No, I hear you, man. That's it's it's fair enough. I mean, what, what can you do? You know, I mean, like, that's your that's your choice. And that that's what you're sticking with. It's what you need to do to, to you know, to, to maintain. So, oh, yeah. My yeah, life just, would disappear if I went back in weeks, right. not even months, weeks would disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Tell those people to to, to buy a, a CD or something instead of buying a <laughs> <laughs> Why not, right? Buy a shirt. Buy, buy yeah, that would, it certainly helps. It's half our money. I don't think people yeah. realize that. Yeah, that's Shirts right. are half of our money. Yeah. There you go. Um, let's move on to the next song, Unsung. Oh, yeah. The big single. Mm -hmm. To I mean, die yes. unsung would really bring you down. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. Such a great song. Yeah, it's a good hook, man. Uh, this is their biggest song, most well known, uh, maybe debat debatably their best, you know. Uh your your take on this song? Um, I remember seeing it on MTV too. I don't know if it was Beep Some Butthead <laughs> or if it was 120 Minutes or if it was Headbangers Ball. I mean, that's the cool thing about a band like this is that they cross boundaries, genre boundaries, which are, you know, nowadays they're 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 really blurry lines. But back then it was pretty it was pretty pretty defined if you know what what you were and i mean that's you gotta think like that's right as nirvana was happening which obviously changed everything and before them there was you know the pixies and sonic youth and there were bands that were outside of the mainstream but they weren't they weren't international superstars it wasn't part of the culture yet you know so so blurring those lines is it was very a very intriguing thing when I was listening to the episode you did with Curran, you guys were talking about Nothing Shocking and that album certainly, you know, foresaw the the Alternative Nation explosion about four years before it happened. Right. And I loved that band too when I was a teenager. Oh my God. I mm. thought they were fantastic. I saw them four separate times. Um, mm. I loved them um, be, for the same reason that Curran did because that Guns N' Roses record came out of the same year, 88. And like, it... uh it was it was doing multiple things simultaneously much like helmet helmet did where it was heavy music but wasn't you know sexist stupid shit uh and it wasn't mm -hmm. any you know like there wasn't a it wasn't like this bro bro vibe although i know that i'm i'm sure in the scene they came from they weren't thought of as like cool guys i'm sure they right. weren't i'm sure they weren't part of that scene um Right. That people probably associate with them, like Cop Shoe Cop and Swans and other mm -hmm. New York bands from the from the late '80s and early '90s, who I love dearly. Um, but yeah, I think they were they were whether they realized it or not. And that song's a great example of it. It was tough, but also had that really good vocal melody mm -hmm. um, that was, you know, melodic <laughs> on yeah. top of this very forceful, you know, very masculine music. Uh, mm. Yeah, that's it's no wonder why they. I don't know if it was them or the label that chose that as a single, but it's no mystery why, you know. Yeah, it's catchy, you know. Yeah, it is catchy, and actually, um, they released it prior to this album. They released it on Amrep as a single. Yeah, we actually did. A, um, we've done two songs for Amrep. Um, we did a. Let's see. The first one they did was one of the dope guns in Bucking in the Streets. It was uh, thirteen mm -hmm. that um, Tom, who owns the label, had bought our downloads of our first two eps and like i was so excited because i didn't know him or anything back then i was so excited about it i took a, a screenshot of like the paypal email with his name on it mm -hmm. and like posted it on the instagram or whatever like i was so excited and then um he asked us to do a song for dope guns and fucking in the streets and we wrote and recorded a song in 48 hours and sent it to him because we didn't want him to be waiting on us um, wow so like That's that awesome. day i wrote a song and we recorded it the next day in our practice space 
Nice. Um, and then we did, he used to do this thing called Bash um, at, he used to, well, he still owns a place called Grumpy's in Minneapolis, but there used to be two of them. And his office for the label was behind the, the one that's no longer there. And he would do these shows every other year, odd numbered years, just called Bash. And we did Bash 17. And he did a companion record for that. And we we also wrote and recorded a song very quickly for that um, mm. that release. And yeah, I, I mean, a lot of the bands that I ended up really relating to, the, the first two that come to mind are, are Mud Honey and Melvin's both got a significant boost from him you know mm -hmm. so m rep yeah. is a big deal to me for sure i have two m rep shirts and a hat <laughs> okay i'm actually gonna yeah. ask you about that in a little bit but uh as far as unsung is concerned um i can only imagine if, if page felt it in his gut that that might be a big one you know like uh yeah th there's no there's no telling like if that was going to be a massive song or not like, I don't yeah. think there, there was any foresight in seeing, like, how big that song would actually become. Yeah. Um, is there any song on your new album that uh, that you feel might be a big one? Um, There's a handful of songs in this record that are really fast, which is strange. Because I think we only had, like, maybe two fast songs on the last record. but And then we had a couple other ones that we didn't put on the record that, same thing, they're kind of fast. And it seems like when we were thinking about doing the first video we sent a couple different tracks to our friend whitey who did the video um to see what he thought we should do and he was like no nah, you need to do the mid-tempo one because like the head bobber is gonna be the one that people really latch on to if it's too fast it'll be over too soon there's not enough time to really kind of grab onto it and i trust his opinion too i mean he in my opinion has great taste in music um mm. and he cold called us on facebook a long time ago and said hey I make videos. I'd like to make a video for a band. And I was like, Oh, who's this asshole? And then I went and looked at his, his like website. It's ridiculous. His credits are absurd. Like oh, yeah. le legit famous people like that. He's worked with. Yeah. It's so crazy. But, um, I don't know if we have anything super catchy on this record. Um, I want to say that we don't actually, I want to say that there's like, there's a lot of songs that are like fairly gnarly. Um, on our last one before this, we had a song that was like the one that we did the video for that was kind of catchy and it was kind of like, you know, Nirvana E sounding, although kind of fast. But I don't think there is one on this record. I think this is a pretty gnarly record, you know? Hmm. Okay. You so you you don't think it's like uh commercially viable? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, okay. I would love to make a million dollars. I just don't see it happening, you know. Right, right. Okay. Well, I, I you know, know what? I, I, I would love that to be like the 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 take. And and have it be the opposite. Have this record end up being like blown up and being like a, a It'd massive be amazing. success. Sure, it'd be great. Of course, I mean, people who say they don't want that are lying. You know, I mean, when right. you get there, it might suck. But before that, I mean, I saw I just sold the guitar to pay rent not that long ago. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sucks. I didn't want to sell right. it, man. But like to make to make money off of what you love, who doesn't want to do that? Give me a break. Like that yeah. would be amazing. Of course. Um, now, sure. being well known would probably suck, but I don't think we're in any danger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the name of the band is already controversial, and it's like always misinterpreted as misogyny or as at best tone deaf and not realizing what it could mean to some people. But mm. at the top of all of our social media accounts, it says what our name is about. It's more about economics than than any sort of gender or social issue. But you know, nuance mm. doesn't exist anymore. It's just the ones and zeros, black and white. Right. Bumper sticker, sloganeering. It's just what people respond to. And I don't come from that world, so I'm not participating. Don't care. Sure. I don't need everyone to like it. I don't care. You know, I want right. people to come to our shows. Yes. I want people to like our records or buy them, but like it does not need to be all things to all people. It just doesn't. And it won't ever be. So I'm not worried about it. And when somebody comes at us and they have a problem with it, I'm like, I don't want to be insensitive and I don't want to write people off because I think. Uh, you know, in a perfect world that comes from a desire for us to to love each other. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. However, this is a punk band. Go fuck yourself. Well said. All right. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's go on to the next song. Uh, turned out. You turned out. Yeah, it's got that that one riff that in the chorus that goes like. Yeah, that's a that's a cool one. Yeah, um, that's a good riff. 
So Paige said that this one took a long time to write. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I wonder why. He didn't go into great detail. It just said it was it did it was definitely the one that took the longest. Um, huh. what, do you, what do you consider a long time for for the songwriting process? Oh God! Like I said a moment ago, like we've had some riffs for years that we just never turn into a song. I mean, one of the riffs uh, that was going to be on the new record, um, this song that we Casey made up the main, the bass player in the band made up the main riff of the song and sent it to me, made a demo of it, and sent it to me. And we started playing it in the room and we ran into the same problem where we kept trying to add something to it that was more than that. And what we should have done is deconstructed it and made that the thing and do less and less and less. Um, hmm. And we actually recorded the song and it wasn't good enough for the record. So it didn't, it's not on the record. Um, we've since gone back to that song and said like, let's go. We got too far away from the original. What made it cool in the first place? So mm -hmm. we got back to that, to that original thing, and it's awesome again. And like that, that riff is in. Um, I'm not sure if it's threes or sixes, but it's in an off off kilter sort of um, time signature. And uh, we did the same thing. We we the riff goes like na 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 na. So we do that's the main riff, and then the verse for that is the the same feeling but a single note it doesn't climb up it just stays on the same note which is, i mentioned it two or three times already it's like right. it's the best trick in the world and it yeah. works because it makes it sound like a song and not shit you paste it together it's sure. different versions of the same thing and i bet Paige ran into that problem i bet that's what's going on because there are a couple riffs in that song that that are compelling and interesting but i'm not sure that they go together and i bet that's what the problem was hmm. you know like okay. having this thing that you respond to and then the more you work on it the worse it gets it's like horrifying you know it sucks i've definitely been there right um well, yeah so, and so what song what song on the new album took the longest um let's see there is a song um that we there was a version of this riff years ago that we just never play never really latched on to and I held on to this riff for the longest time and eventually um, figured it out. And um, what is that song called? Because uh, there are two there are two sort of versions of it on the record. There's like the actual song. And then at the end of the record, it's that song. It's that melody of that song. But Ryan and I recorded it, made it sound like a Muzak kind of elevator music thing. Okay. And then Bill... Kelleher from Mastodon reads the credits of the record over it. <laughs> but the um what the hell is that song even called? I can't even remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um hmm. what is it? Something reprise. Um I can't believe it. I can't even remember. I don't have it in front of me, so I can't even remember what it's called. But the riff I had for a long time, it was kind of like me trying to do that birthday party swing. Um, and but once we put it in the context of the band, it got super heavy and even though it has like a little razzle dazzle to it, it's still definitely our band and and definitely very big and very heavy and very, you know, open bar chords, you know, drop tuning stuff. Um, what is it called? Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 yeah, it's got like a Jesus Lizard kind of big bandy thing to it. Um, but yeah, good lord. I've had I had that riff for probably close to 10 years. Hmm. And it, it just never I never turned it into a song because if I start working on it and it starts going in a direction I don't like, I don't try to fix it. I just I just abandon it and move on to something else. Because if it doesn't make me feel good, I don't want to feel bad about myself. So I just stop doing it. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, so let's Strange. go. Let's go the opposite direction. What's the fastest the song has came? Oh God! So that song we did on the on the dope guns and fucking in the streets. That song was called uh, "Bloody Like the Day You Were Born." Oh right. We re-recorded that song for Gold. Um, but I literally wrote that song in, in an evening and showed it to the band that afternoon and we recorded it that night. So that was 48 hours. Hmm. And that okay. song has a lot of different parts. Um, but it's a lot of those parts are different versions of the same part, you know? Right. Uh, different variations that, of the same progression kind of. Yeah, man. It's, uh, I wish someone would have hit me to that a long time ago, like explained it to me, like you're playing this riff what is the most vital part of this riff now just play that and repeat it 
um, it's it really is like a trick, yeah. you know. Right, simple one. So yeah, yeah, that happened so fast, and okay. we played that song in our set for like four years. It's not in our set now because we played it so much, but um, it's it gets kind of fast. Um, so at least for the drums, like the bass drum is just constantly going during this one part. So, um, we have to kind of pick and choose as far as tempos for live set, because we like to kind of start real strong. And then if it's a, um, if it's a headliner set, have, you can have two sort of troughs in the set, um, before you finish strong. But if it's a support set, you can have either one trough or low point or none. So you just, you know, you need to kind of pick your songs. Um, and we wanted to play a couple other fast ones or, you know, more aggressive ones uh, mm -hmm. in the new set. So we we haven't played it in a while. But yeah, that song came super fast. OK, the Great. whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I only have three more for you. Um, we're going to skip down. We're going to pass. He feels bad. Pass better and go to you borrowed. Yeah. Um. Without fear, you borrow is one of the lyrics. Uh, and you actually already kind of mentioned this earlier, but uh, do you borrow without fear any elements from Helmet? Yeah, I absolutely take from from other from other writers, from other bands. From I mean, you're you're fooling yourself if you think you don't. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to be afraid of it and say like, "Oh, this riff sounds too much like this." And man, by the time you put it through the grind of your band, it's going to sound nothing like that. We have a song on the new record called Hieronymus Bosch Was Right. I'm not sure if that was sent to you on that preview thing or not. I think it was, yeah. But that yeah. song started as like Nirvana worship. It sounds nothing like Nirvana. Mm -hmm. But when we first did it, I thought I was doing Nirvana. And I was kind of concerned about it. And I I in, maybe not intentionally borrow from people or steal from people, but I knowingly do so. Sure. And I don't worry about it because I know once everyone else gets their hands on it, it it's not a, it's not going to be a problem you know it's yeah. fine um right yeah when you hear like an actual riff like i've heard a reel on instagram the other day of this kid who's like a country singer and as soon as the riff started playing i could tell it was crazy train but like played with a couple different notes and it just reminded me of the vanilla ice queen thing and it's oh, like yeah. okay that is not acceptable because right any reasonable person would hear that and go the fuck are you doing that mm -hmm. is not acceptable but borrowing a feel borrowing a line i've heard i it sounds snobby but i've heard a band who i will not name because i don't want to shame them literally take two separate lines from one of our songs and use them as their own and at the time i was really pissed about it i was like how dare they do mm -hmm. that and they know us so like i know they did it you know and we play shows together so like i know they did it and now i'm flattered by it um sure another friend of mine said that they took a riff of ours for something and they're in a band a, a lot bigger than ours so i'm not going to name them either and i was flattered by it i was like that's awesome that's so cool that like this band who's huge like said they took something from us which it, i'm sure it sounds nothing like us man i'm sure mm -hmm. it's fine yeah so i think most bands do it you know sure it's fine it's yeah. totally fine it's if it's an homage, then then great. You know, I mean, there's yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing better than like saying that you can you've you've influenced somebody that's that's influential themselves or that that you just admire. Yeah, and respect. yeah. There was a band called the Rye Coalition from Jersey City, like in the '90s, and a lot of people said you know can would accuse them of being of sounding like Jesus Lizard. I'm like, yeah, the Jesus Lizard's fucking awesome. So like, I don't have a problem with it, man. It doesn't sound just like it. It has like some skinny, you know, like like slinky sounding jazz ish guitar note choices that sound a little off kilter like them and has a couple of rhythms like them, but it doesn't sound like them. It's influenced by them and I love them. So I'll probably like it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to the next one. FBLA two. Why is it called that? Do you know? Future what's business the, leaders. What is the acronym? Future business leaders of America. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew, but I always wanted to know what that was. There you Future go, man. Business leaders of America. That's happy hilarious. to help. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's called and why two, is it two? <laughs> because, well, this is just something I figured out. I'm, I'm doing the research is because there's a prequel to this on the first full length record. Strap it on. Yeah. FBLA. There's FBLA. So this is yeah. FBLA oh, what, two. That's so funny, man. 
Yeah. I don't know why like he named it that. I don't think that lyrically it has anything to do with future businesses, future business leaders of America. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about like I know I listened to the first record, but I only listened to it like once. So I don't know. I can't remember those songs. So I don't even remember if these sounded alike. They don't sound alike to me. I mean, who knows? OK, but, but I, um, um, I've mentioned this before. I give songs titles before I write the lyrics for them. Um, and sometimes it's the way the song sounds to me, I give it a, a title, a working title so I can remember the song instead of saying like choppy riff, I'll call it, you know, like uh rabbit hop or something. I don't know, whatever, mm -hmm. just before it has singing. But when I start, when I get in the spot of writing words, which is generally after the song is done um, and then we'll tweak it number of times, number of times you do the parts and stuff. But um I always give the song a title to, so I have a box to work in, so I know what doesn't go thematically with the title. Um, so maybe that's what he was doing. Maybe it sounded like something about the song sounded like future business leaders. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know either because he didn't get, didn't go into great detail. So yeah, um, I was going to ask you about Amrep at this point because because this song originated as the as a song on the first album, which was released by Amrep. I just wanted yeah. curious about your connection to Amrep and like how you how you uh, how that came about. Yeah, I mean, he. I don't know how he like how he even started talking because, like I said, he had bought like the first couple records, and I don't know if he saw us play in Minneapolis. Maybe I never really asked him like how he how he heard about our band or whatever. Yeah. Um, and we had, we had talked to him about possibly releasing this record and like he, the kind of stuff he's doing right now with the label is more like a one and done thing. He doesn't like press records and always have them in stock. And it's not like a regular model for how a record label operates. Right. So it probably wouldn't work for us. We would just do like a one-off thing mm -hmm. with the cool, you know, cover or whatever. And then it'd be gone. So it's, he said, he, his, he said, it's more like the, sort of boutique toy market more than anything else it's bespoke for lack of a better term right. um, which just doesn't work for our band you know but um yeah i don't i have no idea how he how he first even heard about us um hmm. do you, and you don't have like a relationship you don't have a relationship Pardon? with him now well, yeah absolutely now yeah um, i mean so he's you, great you... and we had talked about doing uh some re-releasing our first two eps uh through him as well um, and that just didn't happen because we had even sent the artwork and we were about to do it. But then he got a slew. I think Melvin's came into uh, possession of a lot of their older material. So then he started repressing all these special edition Melvin's records. And he's just one guy, you right. know, yeah, so yeah. that's obviously going to keep him busy. And he just didn't have the time for it. So, yeah, of course, with the yeah, Melvin's, too. I mean, like how many, what, 10, 20 records? So. <laughs> unbelievable. They're new. I haven't heard the new record, but the single of the new record sounds awesome. That song is badass. I haven't heard I it yet I love them either. since I was a kid. What's that? I haven't listened to it yet either. Yeah. That the last record is of theirs cool, I listened. Yeah, the last re record of theirs I listened to was uh, the the Five Legged Dog one. Oh yeah, sure. Which was sure. the fucking five record one. Like it was ridiculous how many songs was on that. They're was pretty uh um what's the word when prolific? you produce a lot of material? Prolific. Prolific, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, my it's favorite crazy version of their band which is gonna be sacrilege i mean i love lysol and i love you know um uh osma and like you know i love uh gluey porch treatments i love the um a lot of different versions of the band but like dude the two records they did with with cody and jared the nude with boots and um uh, senile animal i think it's the best stuff they've ever done which is crazy to say hmm. but like it's so good and we did our um we've been to europe four times now um four different tours and we're going to do our fifth one later this year but um the very first time we went over there was opening for big business um hmm. and i don't even we didn't know them prior to that but we got the offer to do it and we were like hell yes and then they're like well we need to talk about money and we're like i don't care we're doing it like hell yes we're doing it um and i was a big fan of carp jared's old band too um and uh yeah it's weird to think that this iconic band who like basically invented a genre my two favorite records of theirs are the sort of modern one it's insane to think but hmm. those records are great man. <laughs> yeah there's some riffs 
And Jared's voice and Buzzo's voice sounds so good together that when they both sang. Man, it's hmm. a beautiful sound. Hmm. All right. I'm going to have to listen to those because I've, I've only recently got back into the Melvins. I was just talking to uh, Blake Bickle of uh, Bronson Arm. And he, yeah, actually, yeah. I just spoke with them or just sent them a message asking them about like if they tour or whatever. I like them a lot. They're good. Yeah, yeah they're great. And yeah. uh, we talked about Houdini. So I had to kind of do all that research. <laughs> and kinda, yeah, great one. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so in closing, we have the last song, Role Model. Uh, so let's see. Uh, T.M. Stevens. He played for James Brown and Pretenders, Tina Turner, stuff like that. Wow. Uh, spoke with Paige Hamilton and uh, said, uh, Helmet is like a big bowl of ice cream, but when you dig in, there's spinach inside. <laughs> what a funny perspective. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was curious if, uh, is there anything, is there any way you've heard someone describe horrors that you liked? Um, I mean, no one is ever going to care about it as much as I care about it. And I, that was a revelation to me when I would get upset about, you know, people who are involved with us in a business sense, like not thinking about it obsessively like I do. And then I was like, you're being unreasonable, man. No one by definition is going to care about it more than I do, you know? So I need to stop holding people to the same standard I hold to myself. But, uh, it is funny when people come up to you and say like that they, they want to say something nice, but they mention other bands that I can't stand and say like my two favorite bands are you guys and Pantera. I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and they mean well, but like, yeah, yeah, I don't know, man. I think there are, there are people who, who get it for, you know, who get it. And then there are people who like our name for the wrong reasons. And I would never change our name because it would betray the people who understand it and and get it for the right reasons. I mean, I think it's a real careerist asshole thing to do that. And I know some people who have done it, but like, I get it in the time we're living in. I get why they want to do it. It's caused us so many problems. And those are just the ones we know about. I mean, mm. God knows how many opportunities we've we've gotten passed on because of our name. I'm sure there are plenty. Um, there been a lot of problems. But um, if I were to go back, I would not call the band horse. I would have named it something else. I had no idea it was going to be the 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 hurdle that it is. But despite that, we're still doing pretty well, you know. So it's like mm. I think we're hopefully getting to that point where we're, where we're able to sort of transcend the name. Um, I know that people might have a friend that says, Hey, you should check out this band. I like them. They're cool. What's their name? Whores. Not interested. I know that happens. It's a bummer. Right. But yeah, like I yeah. said earlier, we don't need to be all things to all people. And I feel like over time, the dust will settle. And, you know, we play with a lot of bands that are, you know, supposedly like big bands. And they're not that good, man. You know? Mm -hmm. Right. And we practice our asses off and I don't want to see it as a competition because it's, it's art and it should be subjective and it should not ever be thought of in those terms. That being said, we try really hard to, to do it the best we can. I mean, to, to my detriment, sometimes, like I, I said, I, you know, I fell down on stage once in Canada and had to have knee surgery. I mean, I blow my voice out all the time. I mean, and it just happens, but, I don't know, man. I would never do it any other way. I'm trying to think of of things that people have said about our band that that get it. But the the thing that keeps popping up in my mind is people who like have the wrong idea about our right. band. Yeah, and there's like nothing I can do about it. And I appreciate those people, even though they they might have the wrong idea. They still like our band, and they they love us, and they're important. And you know, I, I would never betray those people, you know? Right. Yeah. It's too important, too important to, to have fans that are, uh, you know, willing to come out, you know, yeah. pay, the, pay for the ticket, buy the yeah, album, it, whatever it is. If even it means to something it. to them, it doesn't matter what it means. It means something to them and you need to respect that, you know? Right. Like when we were putting together a set list for these, you know, for these shows coming up, we never want to be the band that just says, all right, 
half of our set is going to be all new songs that you've never heard before because that's the band just ignoring the people who like their band and that's not cool you know oh, yes yeah. play your new songs but like unless you're saying hey this is a special thing we're going to play the new record in its entirety unless it's built and promoted that way when i go see twisted sister do you know what i'm saying you like, see twisted i want to rock play i want to rock that's what oh. i want to see you know? oh yeah that's that's a given so like <laughs> don't betray that you know what i mean these people are the ones who who are allowing you to do what you do at that level so respect respect that you know yeah it's, i never want to feel like i'm letting people down i always want to level up level up level up every time you know hmm. well i mean with with uh I guess the hope is that there are all the people that love you now are going to love the new record just as much. And so you so. won't even have to yeah. be concerned about that. You can just play whatever the fuck you want and everyone's going to love it no matter what. I hope so, man. We'll see. I mean, <laughs> I'm always worried about, about it because like, you're not supposed to read YouTube comments. You're not supposed to read. And it's not that I care what strangers think about our band. I just don't want to betray someone who already likes our band. I don't want to let them down. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's that quote about like, about, I think it was Elvis Costello who said it. And it's like, you can't read the reviews because, you know, the good reviews aren't good enough and the bad reviews are probably right. You know, <laughs> so you just, you just can't do it, man. You just can't. You're just going to oh, torture yeah. yourself. No, man, but, you're, you're too busy focusing on, on doing the work anyway. Like you, you shouldn't have time for that even really. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, we're about to. As soon as we get going here in April, we've got our release show for the new record in Atlanta. Oh, before that, we've got a show in Chicago, um, like a, a festival um, called Forever Deaf on March 30th in Chicago at Avondale Music Hall. And then we've got um, our release show in April. I believe it's like the the record comes out the 16th. I think the release show is like the 24th or 26th or something, end of April. Okay. And then the U.S. headliner is in starts in May, goes all the way through June um and then we'll probably take july but then we're going to do another u.s tour i think in the fall and then europe in october and then the holidays and then 2025 we plan on basically touring the whole year um as support for other bands and we're about to get very busy which is wow. exactly how we like it you know yeah yeah of course and we I already mean... have a, 11 new ones that douglas and i have um demoed at the space so we're gonna try to just bang another record out real quick oh nice all right man yeah well that's that's amazing uh looking forward to it because uh man 2025 will be here before you know it i'm sure it i'm yes, sure it will. Of it. <laughs> yes it will been fucking blown by already man that's weird yeah well um that, that i mean that, that covers the record um and you already mentioned the tour is coming up uh the record's already available for pre-sale it's already in its yeah. second pressing or third pressing third now yeah it's in its third pressing for pre-sales now yep. Yep. um i'll provide links and all that shit in the show so if, if people need to need an easy access to it they'll have it all right man. well i'll let you go um best of luck okay yeah thank you oh, uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon i'm sure i'll be up in providence before too long all right man well if you are let me know all right take care all right man you too